Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. It's exciting chapters in all the Bible. One that's often memorized and quoted, it's John 3, 1 through 21, which of course deals with the most familiar passages, John 3, 16. This is extremely interesting chapter because it deals with the primary question of how is man right with God? You know, if there was anybody who should have been right with God, it was Nicodemus. Here was a man who was zealous, who was moral, who was religious, who was civic-minded. Here was a man who had all the credentials of the world. And Jesus told him he had to be born again. I think it's going to be a real interesting discussion of exactly what we mean by that term, born again. Why did Jesus use it? What did Nicodemus understand by that term? I think there's some unfortunate misconceptions today about it, and we'll be dealing with that. Let's look, if we could, at the context for a minute. John is the only gospel that records Jesus in Jerusalem very early in his life, but apparently it's a Passover feast. Jesus cleanses the temple in the previous chapter and begins to teach and do many mighty miracles. And because of that, a man named Nicodemus came to him. Let's look at verse 1, if we could. Now, there was a man named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees and was a leader among the Jews. Now, the word Nicodemus is a Greek word. It sounds funny for a Jewish leader, a Pharisee, but his name is Greek, and it means conqueror of the people or victor of the people. Now, he was a Pharisee. The party of the Pharisees were one of several political parties in Judaism. There was the Sadducees, who were the more... Uh, economically elite, the priesthood, uh, goes back to the family of Zadok, we think. And they accepted only the first five books of Moses. They were the conservatives. The Pharisees were a party that began during the uh, Maccabean period. It means the separated ones. They are the ones who are so committed to keeping uh, all the law. They, they made a vow they would keep all of the law. And so an oral tradition grew up around the law to so, show them exactly what every aspect of the law meant 24 hours a day. And these men were committed to keeping that law. Now, there's other groups we talk about, the Zealots, who are a political group trying to overthrow Rome, but these are the two major ones in Judaism, Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, he was a Pharisee. It says he's a ruler of the Jew. Now, my translation has a leader among the Jews. This is a technical term to be a member of the local town council. Now, since we're talking about Jerusalem, it means he was a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the highest court, the highest authority of the Jewish nation. Had 70 people. They were elders, they were scribes, they were Pharisees, they were Sadducees, and they made up this supreme court of the Jews, and Nicodemus was a member of that. Shows his standing and statue. Now, notice what it says, And he came to Jesus, who walked out, and said to him, Now, many people who try to interpret the, the Gospel of John very mystically or symbolically, make the word night mean uh, the darkness of his soul. Well, I think that John does use a lot of uh, symbolism, a lot of uh, mysticism, but I think here probably what's happening is one of two things. Nicodemus came at night so nobody had seen because he didn't want himself to be caught up in Jesus' reputation. He could help it. You know, he, he thought he was from God, but he wasn't sure. He wanted to know a bit more about this boy. The other view is that the rabbis taught that you need to study the Torah at night when there's less distractions. So maybe uh, Nicodemus came because of the press of the crowd in the daytime and he couldn't have a private moment with him and he wanted to sit down and discuss these things with him. It's as good an explanation as this mysticism idea. Now, notice where it says teacher. Now, that's the word rabbi. Rabbi is a technical term on the Jewish people of Jesus' day to describe someone who has graduated from one of the rabbinical schools. It's, it's one who has been trained in the law. Who, who, but here, Jesus doesn't have those credentials. It's, it's a, a title of honor that Nicodemus is calling him rabbi. We know uh, that you have come from God, for no one can perform these wonder works that you are doing unless God is with him. Now, when it says here, remember, we're going to have to interpret this in the light of what Nicodemus could have understood in his day. We don't want to read a whole lot of our full-blown theology back into this until we have tried to discover what Nicodemus would have understood. Jesus is talking to him, and we have to first go to that historical, grammatical uh, uh, setting before we can go on. Now, when it mentions here, you have come from God, many have thought we're speaking of the prophet that Moses mentioned would come after him and show them all things, Deuteronomy 18, 18. 
Now it says here, no one can perform, the words present tense there, Jesus apparently performed many mighty signs. The whole Gospel of John is based on seven miracles and an interpretation of those miracles of which Nicodemus forms the first one, first dialogue. Now, when it says, unless he is of God, that is a conditional sentence in Greek. It is a third class conditional. Nicodemus is saying, I think you're of God, but I'm not 100% sure, would be the implication of that third class condition there. Now, what Nicodemus is doing is the very thing that, that Jesus admonished people to do in John 10:38, when he said, if you can't believe of me of what I say, believe in the works that I do. Well, that's what Nicodemus was doing. He said, look, I've seen you do some things that I know are from God, and I know you've got input. Here was at least a Pharisee that didn't think that Satan was the source of Jesus' miracles. Here was a Pharisee that was really open and searching and looking for something. Well, in verse 3, Jesus answers his question when he hadn't even asked a question, but Jesus apparently knew what he was wanting to ask, and so he said, I solemnly say to you, now yours has amen, amen, or verily, verily, if you have King James, no one else in all of history have we found used the word amen to begin a sentence. Amen means I confirm, I agree. And to use it first is a way of talking about the, uh, uh, I, I truly say to you, or this is important, listen up, something like that. Um, I solemnly say to you, no one can ever see the kingdom of God unless he is born from above. Now, the word kingdom of God is very important. It is a concept that is central in the Gospels. It is the subject of Jesus' first sermon and Jesus' last sermon. The subject of most of the parables. The kingdom of God, we learn from the Lord's Prayer, is the complete reign of God that is right now in heaven that will reign on earth. And so what Jesus is talking about is the reign or control of God in men's hearts now that will one day be consummated in the future. And so it's here and now, but it's not consummated. And that's the idea here. No one can... We would say analogously, be saved, be right with God, be in relationship with God would be analogous kind of terms. Now, the word born again, unfortunately, has been used in a modern sense in a very unfortunate way. People go around saying, are you born again? Are you born again? Friends, if you're a Christian, you're born again. Now, you may not use that term, and you may not describe your faith that way. This was never meant to be a theological watchword to divide Christendom. Yucko, yucko. Now... I think it's important here, though, that born is an aorist, passive, verbal form. It is completed action. Born and the idea of passive means from an outside agent. It's a God's initiative. <clears throat> Nicodemus couldn't do it. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Here is a man who, for every outward uh, appearance, looked like he had arrived. He'd arrived spiritually. He'd arrived ac academically. He'd arrived morally. He'd arrived civically. Jesus told a man who everybody thought was already there, that he had to begin again. Woo, what's, what's he saying? Primarily the focus of this is, Nicodemus, you can't be right with God by your goodness. God has to take the initiative. It's a radical change. It comes from God, not from man. Man's religiosity is not the basis for a right relationship with God. Woo! Now, Nicodemus misunderstood this. He didn't understand quite what he was saying. Now, the word uh, uh, again born again, can mean from the beginning, a second time, or from above. It's a very ambiguous term. Now, many people say, well, Jesus spoke Aramaic, and Aramaic wouldn't have that kind of difference. I agree that Jesus spoke Aramaic. I think that's, uh, no one would doubt that when he was with Jewish people, for sure. But friends, I also believe, presuppositionally, that we have a record of the ins of inspired record of what God wanted to communicate to the church today through the Greek language. And so it becomes very important that we analyze the Greek and not go back to a subjective hypothesis of an Aramaic original, which we don't have, and which words we're not sure of to base our theology on. Now, notice what mentions here. Born again. Now, the next verse, Nicodemus understood it as being born again. He said, I'm too big. Maybe his mother was dead. We don't know how old he was, but he said, I, I can't be born again. That's physically impossible. Jesus said, I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying, Nicodemus. John uses this term, this same term, enough that I think a correct translation, instead of born again, is born from above. We're talking about a spiritual birth over against a physical birth. Now you say, well, where, prove that to me. This same word is used in John 3.31 and 1911 and many other places in the Bible translated above. Okay? Now, 
Notice where he says there, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he again enter his mother's womb and be born? Can he? Now, Nicodemus is, is trying to take Jesus so literally. The disciples did that often, you know. Jesus said, you have to cut off your arm, and they were all upset. And Jesus is communicating truth through the metaphors and concepts and parables that his day would have understood. Now, Nicodemus apparently misunderstood, but this is something Jesus did all the time. Remember the woman at the well? He said something to her, and she misunderstood it, and he had to correct her interpretation. It seems like Jesus answers people's question with a very ambiguous kind of statement that he has to reinterpret because they misunderstand it. That's what's happening here. Now, beginning in verse 5, it says, And Jesus answered, I solemnly say to you, No one can ever get into the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of spirit. Now, friend, this has caused great controversy. And you say, well, why? Many people have tried to read their theology into this and make this baptism or make this something else. Now, what I do, it's very important to me, is I try to look at the context of the passage, the words of the passage, uh, the parallel passages, and I try to see what Jesus was trying to say to Nicodemus. So we can't read full-blown church theology into a Jewish man who is coming to Jesus probably for the first time on an intimate basis. It had to be what Nicodemus would have understood first. So what would a man, a Pharisee of Jesus' day, have understood about this water and spirit? Now, there's the real question. Uh, the fight over baptism can't be made here. Now, I think if, and he knew the Old Testament, okay, rabbis just, he wasn't rabbis, excuse me, Pharisees would have known that. Now, the place I think in the Old Testament where we get the best understanding of the relationship between water and spirit is Ezekiel chapter 20, excuse me, 36, 25 through 27, where water and spirit are used together for a renewing and a cleansing and a, a new relationship with God that's, that's um, spoken of in terms of the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. Now, many folks have said it relates uh, to, the, to the rabbinical idea of water referring to male semen and therefore referring to physical birth. Some have said, well, I, that's probably right. The water here is, refers to the, the water sack of, of, a, of a lady who's pregnant, the physical birth, the idea of being born by water physically then being born by the Spirit spiritually. Now, I think that fits the context, but here's some other interpretations. Some think it refers to baptism of John. That's in, it, that may be true, because down in chapter 3, verse 22, uh, baptism is mentioned, okay? It, but it wouldn't be baptism per se that's so important. It would be the repentance involved in John's baptism. Now, those who try to make it Christian baptism are reading way too much in here from a full-blown theological distinction that developed later, okay? Now, you say, well, which do you think it is? Well, it's not what I think. It's what I can get from the text. Now, notice the next verse. Whatever is born of the physical is physical. Whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, that tells me that these two verses are parallel, that we're talking about earthly things and heavenly things, or physical things and spiritual things. And so it seems very important to me that what we have here is a dichotomy, not a baptism and a filling with the Holy Spirit, because that is not a good dichotomy. It's the idea of the physical versus the spiritual. I think that is the analogy here that I get from the context. Now, when it mentions the word spirit here, it's the word uh, pneuma. It corresponds to the Hebrew word ruah, which means wind or breath. And you catch that picked up in the next verse. Nicodemus says, I don't still understand what you're talking about. And Jesus said, well, you don't have to understand everything, Nicodemus, to, to accept what I'm saying. Look at the wind. You don't understand why the wind blows where it wills, why it blows one day and bl doesn't blow another, why it blows from that direction, not this direction. The wind's a mystery to you, but you see the effects of the wind on trees and shrubs and grain and how it blows houses down sometimes. The Holy Spirit's like that, Nicodemus. You're not going to understand it, but you can accept it without fully understanding it. It can be a part of your life without your full knowledge. I think it's what he's saying. Now, notice here, if you would, where he mentions... Um, Verse 6, whatever is born of the, of the physical, that word born is perfect passive. Okay, I mean, excuse me, it's perfect, yeah, perfect passive. Born in the past remains today, done by an outside agent. We're born, humanly speaking, we remain human. We're born from God, we remain from God. I like that, that dichotomy there. Now look and see. Yeah, verse 8 is the description that blows where it wants to, and nobody can understand where it goes and comes. Then look down at verse 9. Nicodemus answered... 
by asking, how can this be? And Jesus asked him a question and said, you are the teacher of Israel. I don't know what the definite article means, but it's in there. And you do not know this? I solemnly say to you, we know what we are talking about. And we have seen and we are testifying to. Now, Nicodemus said, we know earlier, which meant that either he, he was one part of the believing group that saw Jesus' miracles in, in the temple and accepted him and were wanting some more uh, knowledge about him. Who the we are here, some said John the Baptist and Jesus. Some say it's the Father in Jesus. Now, John, all the way through, says, I don't do anything on my initiative of what the Father tells me I do. I think the Father is a, is a good deal here. Two witnesses confirm a truth. The Father and the Son are saying this together. But I can't be dogmatic about that. I don't know who the we is referring to. In verse 12 is a first-class conditional sentence assumed to be true in English. If you do not believe the earthly things I tell you, since you do not believe the earthly things I tell you, how can you believe the heavenly things if I tell you about them? Third-class conditional. I may not tell you about the spiritual things, Nicodemus, because you may not understand them. But if I do, you see, it's a third class, removed from, farther removed from um, fulfillment. Now, notice in verse 14. Now, before I get to verse 14, there's a new paragraph division here. I think, John, I think Jesus' words end in verse 13, and 14 through 21 are really John, the evangelist, putting his interpretation on Jesus' words. I started to say we're going to start at verse 14, but let me go back up one and say, and yet no one has gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down out of heaven. That is an affirmation of the pre-existence of Jesus Christ that follows beautifully in the theology of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, the term Son of Man I'll cover in the next section. I personally believe that 14 through 21 starts a new division. Many translations don't break it till 16. I think the outline is as follows. We're talking about Jesus in 14 and 15. We're talking about God the Father in 16 and 17. We're talking about man in 18 through 21. Now, when it says, uh, just as Moses in the desert lifted up the serpent, this goes back to Numbers 21, nine, 4 through 9, about the, the Israel getting bit by snakes, and they were, it was killing them, and they were looking up to that uh, symbol of a snake that Moses put. They looked up there by faith. They lived. If they tried to do the old John Wayne method of cutting the bites and sucking out the blood and putting on a tourniquet, they died anyway. And so the people of Israel begin to uh, realize that a right relationship with God is based on faith. Uh, to show you how perverted we get, this same snake, after a few years, began to be worshipped as an idol and had to be destroyed, 2 Kings 18.4. But anyway, the word lifted up is a, one of those ambiguous terms again. It can mean lifted up like put on a pole. But it's the same word that's translated highly exalted, which shows about the serpent was lifted up, but Christ lifted up was highly exalted. Let me give you a few verses. Acts 2.33, Acts 5.31, Philippians 2.9, where the very same word is used. Now, it says the Son of Man must be lifted up. The word Son of Man is a term that Jesus chose as a self-designation for himself because it had no messianic nationalistic implications. It comes, I think, from a combination of the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is called the Son of Man, which simply means human being, person, stand up, and Daniel 7.13 where one, like the Son of Man, comes before the Ancient of Days, to, riding on the clouds of heaven to receive the eternal kingdom. Now, that is a, a, a man that has divine characteristics. And so here we have a term that combines deity and humanity, and Jesus used that for himself. The word must be lifted up is the word dia, which means it is a necessity he be lifted up, speaking about Christ's death on our behalf, so that anyone or everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life. Now, this is an, a foreshadowing of John 3.16. Everyone, no limitations, all people, anyone who looks can be saved. There's no, there's no people excluded. Anyone, everyone. Who, now, mine has who trust him. It's the, it's the verb pistuo. It, we can, it's the same word that means faith or belief. Now, in Greek, the word believe is not primarily a mental thing, though that's important. We have to know something about Christ. It's not primarily an emotional thing, though our emotions are always involved in our decisions. It is primarily a volitional thing that we choose to follow Christ. The word has the idea, not that we just jump off a cliff in the dark and hope God's there. We know of God's trustfulness. 
and we trust God's trustworthiness in Christ. That's what believe means. It's a commitment. It's a commitment of life. It's a, co it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week commitment to a personal relationship. It doesn't have to do with rules or theology. It has to do with interpersonal relationship based on God's trustworthiness. Now, when it says in Him, notice it's not in facts about Him, it's in the Him as a person. Christianity is not a doctrine or a theology or a denomination. It is a lifestyle, personal relationship with a person, Jesus Christ. Now, eternal life here is very important. You might want to see John 17, 3. What it means is eternal, not in quantity, but in quality. The word life is the word zoe, which is often used in John for resurrection life, supernatural life eschatological life. You might want to see Matthew 25, 46 for the word eternal. If you don't like the idea of, a, of eternal hell, then you have to give up the idea of eternal heaven too, because in Matthew 25, 46, same Greek word is used for eternal life that's used for eternal separation. Now, for the famous uh, John 3, 16, which is really not about Jesus, but about God the Father. Now, let me read it to you, and let me retranslate it some for me to catch the meaning that I see here. For God loved the world in such a manner that he gave his only begotten Son, unique, one-of-a-kind Son, that whosoever believes, trusts, faiths in him may never perish but have eternal life. Notice it's God loved the world in such a manner. It's not the loving Jesus and the angry, mad God. God's the one that sent the Son. This is a verse about the love of God for the world, not just for a few. God loves the whole world. So much, that's not how much, it's how the manner in which he loved the world. God showed his love not by a gushy emotionalism, but by sending Jesus Christ to die. Second, he gave his only begotten son. Now, that seems to imply in English that there was a time when Jesus did not exist, that, he, that God created him or begot him in time. No, that word monogenes means unique, one of a kind, only. So it's not the idea of time, but of quality, distinctiveness, uniqueness. And then it says, so anyone who trusts him, friend, that means you, everyone, anyone, is trying to say that God wants everybody to know him. 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Peter, I mean, 1 Timothy 2, 4, God loves the whole world. God wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to knowledge of the truth. If you're listening to the sound of my voice today, God loves you. God sent his son to die for you. God wants you to know him. And only barrier between you and God is not your sin. Christ took care of that. It's you. No one is too far away from God. No one is too evil. No one is too anything. God sent his son to die for you. That whosoever, believe it, commit themselves to him, should not perish. Implication is, some are going to perish. Yes. Yes. I've done a tape on hell, what is it? A very significant tape on judgment. Who, what, when, where. If you'll write me this month, I'll send you both those tapes. Hell, what is it? Judgment, who, what, when, where? If you'll just write me, I'll send it to you free and postpaid. And notice what it mentions here about, um, let's see. For God did not send his Son to the world to pass sentence on it, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, what we have here is a paradox, because in chapter 9, verse 39, and implied in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said, God sent me to the world to judge the world. Here it says that he came in to not judge the world. I think there's a paradox and not a contradiction. Jesus came to the world to save man, not to condemn man. But the very fact that Jesus has come, and Jesus is the full revelation of God, and that light has come into the world, when men see the light and turn away from him, they are condemning themselves. The very act of Jesus coming in love and forgiveness and mercy is an act of judgment because when men respond to him negatively, they are already condemned. So the purpose was not condemnation. The purpose was salvation. But the very fact that the Son of God, the perfect representative of the Father, has come and shown man what man really is, what God really is, and how they can be right with God, when that's rejected, judgment occurs. Condemnation occurs. Now... The word here, past sentence on it, you might want to see chapter 8, verse 15, when it says, it came to save the world, heir is passive again, once and for all, by an outside agent. Whoever trusts in him is never to come up for judgment. Whoever believes, okay? And notice what it mentions here, let's see, verse 19. 
those who do not believe have already received this sentence because they have not trusted in the name of the only Son of God. Friends, what you do with Jesus is the key. I don't care what denomination you belong to. I don't care what translation of the Bible you use. I don't care how many rules you keep. I don't care how many rituals you've gone through. The basis of Christianity is a personal relationship through Christ to God. To know Him is the essence. To believe in Him. To commit to Him. The rest is frivolous and peripheral compared to knowing him in personal faith. I hope you do know him. If not, read the Gospel of John and ask God to open your eyes.